Hey everyone, on today's podcast, Chad and I interview two of America's greatest U.S. male gymnasts, one who has now transitioned into being the high performance director for the men's national team. His name's Brett McClure. He's also 2004 Olympic silver medalist. And along with him, we have what could be considered uh, one of the greatest U.S. male gymnasts of all time, currently still competing, Sam McCulloch. Sam is a six-time uh, U.S. national champion, two-time Olympian, and still current top guy in our country. Uh, we're going to be talking about some of the changes that happened with regards to Tokyo switching from 2020 to 2021, what it's done for the national team, uh, for the training for Sam as an individual, and the other guys that are training to try to make that team come next summer, as well as Brett as an administrator, uh, trying to keep the guys on track and what that's all looking like right now with the changes. Uh, I think it's a very timely episode, and I hope you guys enjoy it. All right, everybody, welcome back to another Power Monkey podcast. We're uh, pretty fortunate and lucky to uh, get two of the most decorated uh, U.S. male gymnasts of all time with us, uh, both in separate roles right now. But we have Brett McClure, who is now the high performance director for USAG men's side and was also part of the 04 Olympic team that was out in Athens that won the silver medal. Um, God, Brett is almost... Six was sixteen mm. years ago now. Oh, yeah, man. Unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. It's been uh quite a bit of time now, but uh <laughs> seems like yesterday. Right, right. Yeah. And and uh we also have Sam McCulloch, who is um the the top dog, top dog with USA gymnastics for a number of years now, two time Olympian. Uh was on his way to uh hopefully making a third uh games for Tokyo up this upcoming summer with things kind of uh being rearranged a little bit. That's uh some of the things that we're gonna be talking about, but we're really excited about having Sam on as well. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. Um, so we're going to kind of jump into things really quickly with regards to some of the changes. You know, um, with everything going on right now with COVID-19, uh, it's, it's rearranged everything. Everyone's life is kind of uh, taking a 180. And the sports world is uh, ha has been specifically hit pretty hard. And you know, with the Olympics being postponed until 2021, um, curious, Brett, if we can kind of start with you and just get your take uh, from your position as a director now, uh, what are the challenges that you're seeing with uh, having to maintain continuity with guys training and being able to, you know, look at preparedness up to this point? And what are you trying to do and what are you seeing as some of the challenges coming along with, with this postponement? Well, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's the right thing to do. You know, I think uh, the IOC uh, made the right call, um, but trying to stay focused and refocus and reboot um, to gear up for the next year is going to be challenging for everyone, not just the athletes, but staff as well and coaches. And, and we're just trying to figure out a way to uh, you know, ease back in once we're allowed back into training facilities in a, in a healthy way. Uh, try not to rush too much and um, take this time off to, you know, reboot, uh, really spend time with family. If you can uh, relax, pick up a couple hobbies at home, just try to keep your mind at ease. Um, so you're not too anxious. And then hopefully you're fresh and ready to go and, and kick off this next year. Like uh, we did at the beginning of this year, you know, we had high hopes, high expectations. We had done a ton of preparation work for 2020 um, leading up to this, got through uh, the American Cup where, you know, Sam killed it uh, and took home gold for us as part of the Olympic qualification process for Team USA. Uh, and then, as we all know, uh, came to a screeching hold after that. So, you know, that's probably the hardest part, right, is just kind of doing so well and having to kind of stop and take a step back and then reboot. Um, we'll see, you know, we're taking it day by day. And what about uh, you, Sam? Uh, go, go ahead, Chad. Uh, I was just, I was just going to ask because, you know, I've talked about it a little bit with, with uh, Dave, Brett, but other than that, I have no idea how the uh, Olympic team selection goes a whole lot for you guys. So how close were you guys at this point to picking that team? Well, we have uh, uh, had Olympic trials set for the end of June, and that's where we would pick our uh, four-man team. Um, but throughout the year, 
uh, were able to try to get a plus one spot, another guy to go to the Olympics. They wouldn't be able to participate with the team in the team event, but they could participate on all six apparatus. Um, and the way to get that plus one spot was through these all around world cups. And there are four of them, which included the American cup being the first one, one in Germany, one in Great Britain and one in Tokyo as the final one. And the top three countries cumulative score uh, earn another spot for their country to uh, you know, take to the Olympic Games. And that plus one spot would then be selected again with the Olympic trials at the end of June. So yeah. uh, can, can, you, can you expand on that a little bit, Brett? So imagine that our listeners have no idea about gymnastics because we, <laughs> we have a lot of people who you know, are into gymnastics, but most of them didn't really do gymnastics growing up. They found out later in life or some of their weightlifting or just CrossFitters. A um, couple parts to our selection process. And can you explain the changes that have been made to the size of the Olympic team from even from when you were on the Olympic team until now, just kind of go through some of the things that have been changing over the course of the last few years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think 96 might've been the last seven, six, six man team. Yeah. And then uh, in my, in my year, 2004, it was a five person team. Um, now this quad was the first time they've gone down to a four person team. Um, but they've made it, uh, uh, They've made a way for you to potentially get up to six members. Uh, it's extremely convoluted. I don't know how long this podcast usually is, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but um, there's a couple different places that you can earn one of those plus one and plus two spots. All around World Cup, which I mentioned before, uh, there's the individual uh, World Cup events, and that is uh, a place where that individual can earn a spot for themselves, right? So you would have to win three of those events on that specific apparatus to kind of lock in your personal spot. Uh, and then the third and final way to get a plus one spot is through the Continental Championships, which in our case is the Pan American Championships. And we'd have to be one or two in the all around finals um, at the Pan Am Championships and get another plus one spot for your country. Um, so total, you could get a maximum of six athletes to the Olympic Games. Um, but from the last world championships, we were qualified as a team. So we've already locked in our four spot uh, team uh, place into Tokyo. So uh, yeah, that's the best way I can explain it. Uh, there's a lot more details, mm -hmm. six other criteria that play a factor in it as well. But uh, there are still some people in the sport today that don't understand the Olympic mm -hmm qualification process it would be nice at one point in our our lives where they simplify the rules enough to where the people that are actually in the sport actually get it let alone the people that are just watching in the stands but that's incredibly confusing and the thing that i think most people should take away is that mm -hmm. it's four people competing on the next olympic team not five or six it's a four-man team well i'm with you guys there i have no idea how they're going to select this year's olympic team it was a little more simple back in my day but it's there's you know, things called Roby points and all kind of different things going on. I have no idea. So I'm, I'm with <laughs> you guys, but, uh, Sam, you're 28. Is that right? Uh, 27, 27. Okay. I'm yeah. sorry. I gave you that extra year. That's but... <laughs> all right. They've been doing it for years. <laughs> yeah. But you, you will have another year to your life when this next Olympic comes up, we're still over a year away. And, you know, we talked about this with Dave a little bit. He was 28 um in in 2008 in his olympic games adding a whole other year does that um do you have any fear about that because 28 is on the older side of uh high level competition in, in weightlifting and gymnastics i would say and along with that do you either of you guys think that in another year there could be someone in a better position to fill one of those four spots than there are now a lot can happen in one year that's for sure um, right now I am very aware that I'm on that older side of the spectrum. And so what I've really done very well this past quad is stay healthier than I have when I was younger. And so a lot of that has been me really just being in tune with, you know, not pushing the boundaries of what I think my body can actually do and just be smart with my progression. And so with this long break that we're having, what I have to do at home right now is just stay lean, stay fit, and just fire the muscles that you know are gymnastics related so that once I do get back in the gym I can gradually and safely get to 
you know, where I was before this whole uh, quarantine mm-hmm. started. And, you know, there is concern, but I think the best thing that I have learned that will help me more than other people is the fact that I've been very, I've listened to my body more than I think a lot of other athletes have. And if anything, that's something I wish I could spread, tell everyone yeah. to take their time because it's going to feel rushed coming from a month and a half off of no training. Everyone's going to want to get back really, really fast. And, you know, the best right. thing to do is pace yourself and really slow it down. You know, the games really won't be for a whole year and it's going to be fun to get back in the gym. But mm. at that point, it's like, all right, let's actually talk with our coaches, strength and conditioning and our trainers and make sure that when we get back in the gym, we are as safe and as smart as possible. Yeah, that's a great answer. I'll tell you that I didn't even halfway figure things out until I was 31 and I'd, I'd already gone to two Olympics. So that was a little unfortunate on my part. And it sounds like uh, you're in, you're in a much better position. So Honestly, no, it took me two Olympics for me to finally yeah. start listening to my body too. <laughs> and and well, may, maybe that's a common too. theme. Maybe it, yeah, maybe it takes everyone two two times or uh, a certain amount of time. Let's hope not. Let's hope not. <laughs> yeah, but, no, let's hope not. Hopefully people will, you know, we're in a position to, uh, and especially with social media these days and things like podcasts, we can share our, our knowledge and information and hopefully, hopefully uh, more people will listen and learn from our mistakes, right? Yeah, that's that's the hope. That's the hope for sure. Sam, you're in kind of a unique situation being that, I mean, from the 2016 Olympic team, you're the only one that's still training. Is that correct? Yeah. So a whole the, new refresher, guys. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, the value that you bring to the team, aside from just the scores, is a considerable amount of experience. And basically, the guys that have been training up to this point that have all looked like they could potentially be contenders for Tokyo – um, have maybe one world championships, maybe two world championships under their belt. Uh, some of them have no, you know, uh, world level competition under their belt. And none of them for sure have any Olympic experience other than you. Uh, how do you view that experience in terms, and Brett, I want to ask you the same question too, but how do you view that experience in terms of giving you a leg up once you can get back into the gym and knowing that even though we have 14, 15 months, whatever it is before Tokyo actually happens, having gone to two Olympic games, knowing what to expect and knowing how the selection process works, puts you in a much better position. Do you think that has value there? Uh, The best value that I think having been to two games is learning or trying not, I've learned how not to freak out in the preparation for the games. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the only thing that really can take away because you can't practice the pressure of the Olympic games and something I really try to do, you know, when we get into these world champion situations for guys that haven't been a part of the big Olympic or world stage competitions is I just try breaking it down with brutal honesty and, you know, tell them all my experiences and how, you know, open communication actually will help get you through these stressful times because there's so many times you just want to bottle it all up and say you're tough and you know I can handle the pressure and then you get out there and it just builds up on you and so something I really wish someone had done for me when I was going through my first world championships or olympics was to really just break down the fact that they were scared too that you know nerves are a huge thing and you know if you can open up on that certain level and you can indulge all these concerns you're going to be able to overcome them with a group and being able to share that load is going to be way easier and lighter on you when you do get out on that competition stage. And, you know, now that other guys have this experience, you know, we've got only a couple guys and kind of like you said, uh, we've got a whole nother year of younger guys to rise up to, you know, the challenge and, you know, a little more experience for them as well. You know, if there's going to be a lot of, you know, new things happening with the, you know, everyone starting from scratch and coming back. And there's, it's going to be very interesting to see how everyone handles this new pressure. And, you know, it's going to be an exciting year. That's always, always going to be the case come the Olympic Games. Yeah, I think that's a really good perspective on things. Brad, what do you think? Absolutely agree 100% with Sam. Um, you know, him and I will be the only two uh, Olympians or with Olympic experience heading to the Games into Tokyo. And that includes staff you know we have a new president we have a new vp we have a new pretty much everything um they're all trying to navigate this craziness we call the olympic Games. so um communication like sam mentioned has been a big part of this quad a big part of the culture change for everybody on this team Uh, we've tried to create platforms for all of us to to share 
our experiences openly um, so we can uh, take that information and come up with the best plan on how to go out there and execute. A perfect example was this last year's World Championships. You know, we, um, we barely qualified into the team final, regrouped, talked about, you know, what our strategy is, what we've done in all of our preparation and went out and hit 100% at team finals, um, which was awesome. And it was uh, much needed by the entire team and created trust, created more trust. Um, so when we get back into gyms and, and we're at training camps together, um, we continue to push that intensity, continue to push that uh, communication um, and make it a priority. So when we get out to the Olympic Games, it's not any different, right? And that's, that's the biggest thing. You've got to stick to our plan, stay in our bubble, go out there and execute, you know, keep it simple. Uh, don't overthink. Um, there's a lot of hoopla surrounding the Olympic Games and it's very easy to get caught up. Um, you know, Sam can tell you too that there's just sponsors trying to pull you in one direction, family members trying to pull you in a different direction. The organization needs you to, you know, talk to media. Um, a million things going on all at the same time. Um, and so our job is to block it all out, get into the village, hunker down, and stick to the plan. Yeah, you, you guys really said a lot of a lot of things there that were very meaningful to me. Um, you know, uh, Sam, you said something like, um, well, what I took from what you said is there's a lot of, a lot of time and energy wasted worrying about trying not to feel a certain way. You're, like you said, you're going to be nervous. Just accept it, and you'll find a way to overcome it. Stop wasting time and energy trying to feel a certain way. Um, another thing that you said, too, was um, you freaked out in preparation. Oh, man, that was the story of both of my Olympic Games. I changed you know, so many things in my training leading into 2004, didn't learn my lesson and did the same thing in 2008. And it completely affected my, um, uh, my performance there in 2004 and 2008. So I think that is a big, big lesson that, that, that I know you can share with those guys and something that I get, try to get across to athletes in, in, uh, my, in the weightlifting community as well. Yeah, what I did, I think that I hadn't done previous years was once we made, we had our uh, world team squad together and they were announced, we continued talking about, you know, how our training felt and how it went. And, you know, the biggest thing that I could relate to the younger guys that hadn't been in that experience or doesn't have that experience was that, you know, the week and or the two weeks and week before what you leave for world championships are going to be some of the most stressful times. And it's going to eat at you because you want to be perfect and you want things to go well. And it can never go as well as you want those weeks mm -hmm. to go. You just have to, you know, trust that you're still putting in the effort. You've got that muscle memory. And, you know, don't change anything. Don't overdo it. Mm -hmm. Don't freak out when things don't go well because it doesn't mean you're not prepared. It just means you're getting better and better every week. And that was the biggest thing that mm -hmm. I think I could have brought to the team uh, leading up into the World Championship experience. Yeah, I can kind of see maybe the same kind of thing happening with you guys as gymnasts if you're trying to – land a, a, a certain skill or something that that last week, like you're talking about, like for us in weightlifting, we normally always hit our last heavy snatch and heavy clean and jerk about a week and a half, maybe two weeks out. And I've definitely had instances, and I know a lot of athletes have done this, where when I didn't hit the weight that I felt like I needed to hit on that last heavy workout, I sat there and hacked at it. I took it and took it again and again and again and again. And so now I'm sitting here with 10 or 15 attempts at this weight where it should have been only one or two. Mm -hmm. And not only did that, you know, waste a lot of energy and affect my recovery following and going into the next workouts and, um, you know, going into the, into the competition, it reinforced a lot of bad patterns. So have you ever had uh, e any of you guys, all three of you guys, have you ever had an experience like that where you just forced yourself to try to make a certain skill and you kept missing it? Yeah, I think everyone has that has had that experience for sure. It's something where you get in your head, and if it if you don't feel like you can catch that skill or make that skill, and you're going to keep doing it, and all of a sudden it's going to become that thing once you get out on the competition floor that you're worried, like oh, I hope I don't fall on this, like I have been mm -hmm. the whole week leading into this preparation, and that should never be the mentality because if you're thinking about not falling, all you're actually mm -hmm. thinking about is falling. And so it's about trying to really manage what is actually going on in your brain and, you know, 
telling yourself that you got this and positive reinforcement, even when things don't go well, find those silver linings. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. I love the mentality. I think every athlete at a high level kind of ends up going through those things and has those challenges that they've overcome from a mental standpoint. Um, I think one of the things that most people don't really recognize, and we talked about it a little bit, but I think everyone looks at gymnastics as an individual sport. And to me, it's always been more of a team sport, especially at the highest level than an individual sport. And um, I think, Sam, your ability to have that experience to pass along to the other guys that you'll be competing with, hopefully uh, come Tokyo next summer, is invaluable. You know, th those kind of things are, are going to go a long way in being able to kind of help give that team that sense of, okay, what, am, what is it going to take to be able to get out on the competition floor and feel comfortable? My question for you guys, for both of you guys, like, what was your expectations for this summer? I mean, you're coming off of world championships where you guys – hit very well. I mean, it was probably one of the most successful from a hit percentage standpoint in years. Um, you're still off the medal podium. Uh, countries like China, Japan, and Russia are continuing to kind of skyrocket with their talent level and producing of really high-level athletes. Where do you guys see Team USA right now? And what was the expectations going into Tokyo this summer? And do you see that changing uh, now that you have another 14 months before it actually happens? Maybe, Brett, you can start out. Yeah, absolutely. So to answer your question on expectations for, for Tokyo, um, it's stick to the plan, right? We Again, hit percentage is a big deal. Go out there and do your job. And that's really all you can focus on. Don't think about what's out of your control. We are significantly behind uh, these other teams in difficulty. Um, where we can excel is that hit percentage and some of these teams like Japan, for example, has got some young guys coming up that are going out there and this could be their first major international competition. Three up three count is no joke at it's, home uh, too. No joke. Yeah, at, and at home, it's a pressure cooker. Um, if you're confident when you raise your hand and you knock out, you know, all your routines, you give yourself a, the best chance. Right. And then we'll just see where we end up. Honestly. I mean, obviously we want to be on that podium. But we cannot make that kind of the light that leads us. It's about the job at hand. It's about the routine, and it's about the gymnastics, and it's about that performance. And what, T what Sam has done um, as far as bringing that uh, experience, that team mentality throughout this entire quad is trickled down into most of our national team members where anyone can step into that role now. It doesn't just have to be Sam that's the leader out there on the competition floor in team finals. It can be any of the other guys. They all have uh, experience now uh, and understand what that mentality is. And it's a huge part of gymnastics, this, this team event. And it's, it's kind of, for all of us here in this country, the main priority, right? We want to be Team USA. We want to be on that podium for Team USA. We want to bring hardware back to everybody at home. And, and that's priority number one. Everything else is kind of secondary. And, uh, you know, I think having that attitude – going into an Olympic games is the only thing we can do It's the best strategy that we have. And our expectation is to go out there and do what we've been doing in the gym. Yeah. And for me, uh, going into uh, the games, I, it, in the team competition specifically, I knew it would be tough for us to make it onto the medal podium, but what we did have going for us was world championships was a five man team. Olympic games was going to be a four man team which means that the depth of their, of, you know, Russia, China, Japan's fourth guy, that guy was better than our fourth guy. And so now we're closing the gap. So they lost that gap of their fourth place differences between us and, you know, the bigger countries. And so that was actually going to help us in a way to get closer to the medal podium. And if everyone hit 18 for 18 at the Olympic games, we'd probably be fourth again, but what we were really hoping is we can go hit 18 and eight for 18 and other countries will go, you know, 16 for 18 or 15 for 18. And that's how we would be able to sneak up in there. And so really being in the underdog spot takes a lot of pressure off you as well so that you can go out and shine and really, you know, go in with and just put your whole heart out there. And that was something that we were really building off of. And that was really the momentum we started building after world championships is, Hey, everyone just hit really, really well. And we did too. So we have nothing to be ashamed of, but if we can go replicate this and, you know, actually now we've got a whole nother year. So maybe we'll have a lot more difficulty going into this whole new Olympic games, you know, new faces as well. 
So we can actually probably bridge that gap a little bit more between those bigger countries as well. And uh, so that was, that's kind of where I was with the team. Uh, personally, my goal was to, you know, get an Olympic medal in the all around. I didn't care what color, I just wanted one of them. And uh, I wanted to get a medal on high bar as well. And those were my two biggest uh, individual aspirations. And, you know, I just got to hold them off for a whole nother year. I want to, I want to touch on that one more second there. So um, I think it's pretty critical to bring up just you personally, Sam, and your experience. And, you know, in a lot of ways, not only have you been the face of USA Gymnastics for the past coming up almost eight years now, um, you know, you in a lot of ways could be considered one of the best U.S. gymnasts of all time. And I've had conversations with about this with a lot of other guys. But what's been missing is success at the highest level, success at the Olympic Games. You got your first world championship medal recently. And it's always been like a very close missed opportunities, right? Going in being the guy that's maybe right behind Kohei. And, uh, you know, you could be up on the medal podium on a variety of events, not just high bar, but maybe parallel bars, maybe a few other events there. And, you know, you just miss out on an all around because of one event. And it's, it's been a string of world championships and, and Olympic games where you've been missed out by, you know, just a hair. Um, I'm curious if anything has changed or what your mentality is in terms of going into this next competition and what, what's different, uh, what allowed you to kind of make jump through that that barrier uh come last world championships and if that's allowed you to say you know what if i put in that situation again i know i can succeed this time around well you kind of touched on it in that last little portion is i always look at my mistakes as learning experiences and i think anyone that has you know been put in these tough situations they can either dwell on it which i feel like i used to do and then or you could you know use it as uh a learning experience, something you will never do again, like you said. And so really what has changed for me a lot is I thought 2016 was going to be like my greatest year when I was most physically healthy. You know, 23 seemed like the prime age. And after that, I just thought I was going to, you know, my body would start falling apart. And I started kind of prioritizing my emotional health a little bit more over the, my gymnastics. And I slowly started finding this progression where you know, gymnastics wasn't my obsession. It wasn't my number one. It wasn't my life, my everything. Uh, if I didn't have success in gymnastics, I wasn't going to be happy. And all of a sudden, I started pushing that off, and gymnastics started becoming a lot easier and a lot less stressful. And, you know, I, I got a house, a girlfriend, I got dogs. Having this whole transition in my life has actually helped me balance gymnastics. It wasn't, it used, gymnastics used to be this giant mountain, and I was always trying to climb it. Now it's just like this nice little hill that is part of my life. And it's really just been the difference between me in 2016 of, oh my God, you know, this is the most pressure of my life. I can't handle it. And, you know, just putting everything on my back and it just weighed me down so much. And I, that's why I had all these last second, you know, missed opportunities. So as soon as I kind of, you know, chopped down that mountain, I started being able to handle these situations a lot easier. I wasn't thinking about, you know, this is my life goal. It was more, oh, like, this is, you know, me living my life with my passion, you know, as I progress in a life that's also wonderful with my family and, you know, with a lot of people and community that I love. And that's really the big mental transition that I think has helped me figure out that these are learning experiences when I make these mistakes. They aren't just missed opportunities and so I think linearly and I think I'm always getting better every single day and I think all these mistakes you know they are very disheartening and they hurt at the time but when I look back and I learn from them I can only imagine that they all these mistakes will be worth something one day man yeah. you are I gotta say you, you are you have matured Sam you have matured <laughs> a ton I I mean, I remember, you know, we used to come out and while you were at University of Michigan all those years ago and you're still a kid with all the talent in the world. And uh, just to see kind of your growth over the last decade plus, uh, that mentality that you kind of just stated through and, and walked us through, it's, it's incredible to see where you are as an athlete now. I haven't, you know, talked to you about this stuff in a while and it's awesome to see. I mean, it, it really shows me a lot how much you've put into the mental side. And I think so many people need to appreciate that being an athlete is finding balance. And at that level, it, mm -hmm. it is about being able to kind of 
understand that the sports side is just a component of who you are, not everything. It's not all of who you are. So it's awesome to see, man. I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm even more excited to see what happens come the next 14 months now to see kind of how everything plays out. Oh, I appreciate it. Of course, man. Yeah. Brett, what were you going to say there? Uh, just being an outsider, you know, watching Sam's uh, transformational change. Um, you know, when I was first hired, it wasn't that far off the 26 Olympics. And I remember having that first meeting with Sam at the training center talking about exactly this, you know, and it was something that I myself had a, had a challenge with um, 2000 Olympic trials, 99 world trials, complete meltdowns, you know, just took the pressure just took over. Right. And I just remember halfway through Olympic trials in 2000, trying to find that exit sign, get me out of here. Uh, ultimately, you know, retired from the sport for almost three months. So it's kind of like what we're having to go through now, not being able to do gymnastics for a few months, changed my thought process about what it is this sport is to me and what makes me happy and, you know, built a little bit more balance around my life and was able to come back in 2001 and make my first world championship team and run that wave all the way through the quad. And then seeing uh, some of the similarities with Sam and, and his change and the mental approach and, you know, just watching his performance. And that's exactly what it is now. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a performance, right? Like he's out there enjoying it. Um, instead of saying to himself, I have to hit this routine and I have to, you know, medal and I have to be on that podium. And if I don't, then the whole world comes crashing down. I just don't feel that anymore. And, uh, I just have so much more trust in, in his abilities and, and his demeanor out there on the competition floor and also how the team has uh, uh, kind of taken that uh, and learned from it as well. You know, um, it's tough being the top guy all the time. People are always after you. Um, and if you let it get to you, then it's not enjoyable. And then ultimately your performance suffers and, and then you leave the sport with uh, regret or, you know, some kind of resentment feeling, right? So I don't see that at all now. I think, um, you know, people have seen what he's done mentally and try to do the same in their own, um, you know, athletic careers. And it's really kind of helped build a team culture. You know, I feel like all the guys are kind of in a really good place right now. Uh, and it's only going to get better with these 14 months. Yeah, you guys keep talking about balance, and it is such an interesting critical balance that you have to find if you want to perform at your absolute best. And it really reminded me, um, Sam, as you were talking about the movie Cool Running. You, you guys have seen that, right? I can't oh, yeah. There's, there's a, you haven't seen that. Oh, you need to go watch it, man. I mean, yeah, there's, there's a really good quote in there that I carry with me a lot. It says something like, talking about getting an Olympic medal, if you're not okay without the Olympic medal, you'll never be okay with it, right? So we have to have right. these goals. We have to have these goals that we want to achieve, you know, for you guys with the team, Sam, for you as an individual, and you have to have them. They've got to be there in your head, but you also have to have freedom from them at the same time, right? And I, as a teacher uh, of weightlifting in the community that we're in, I spend so much of my time teaching that because if if you don't, have the ability to free yourself of the results that you want and the goals that you have, you're not going to be able to be in the moment, 100% in the moment, the way that you need to, to be able to execute as the way that you need to. And you can do that when you can zone in, then those results, those goals that you have are nothing but a byproduct. And it's really cool to hear you guys kind of say that in your own words and to know that that is your, your mindset of not only for you, Sam, but for you, Brett, as, as their leader, and that's trickling down to the rest of the team. Yeah, that's beautiful. I need to watch that movie. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I can't believe you're an Olympian and you haven't. <laughs> yeah. Actually, something Brett has done really well is when we do have our team meetings, uh, he doesn't just ask, you know, how's your training? How's, you know, are you doing this, this? Are you doing your rehab? It actually starts usually with, what are you doing outside of the gym? What, how are you balancing? Uh, what's something you want to do after gymnastics? Like, where mm -hmm. is your mind outside of the sport? And that's something that I don't think a national team coordinator has ever done before. And it really just, I think, has opened up uh, this whole new team. Because I've never been a part of a national team that has had as much camaraderie as we have at this current point in time. Uh, let me, let me ask a, a question in that regard. Uh, Brett, has there ever been, and not to say anything bad about any other national team coordinators, but has there ever been one that was an Olympian 
or are they usually former Olympians? I don't think so. I mean, that makes a huge difference. You know, we talk about that so much with Power Monkey and the advantage that we feel like we have as coaches is that we do have a talent for teaching and coaching. But when you combine that with the experience of a high level athlete, you know, these types of things that you've learned that have been beaten into you, beaten into you through the failures and the trials and tribulations that you've gone through, you have that advantage. And so I think, you know, it makes so much sense to me knowing, Brett, that you're maybe the first director that is the former Olympian, Olympian that you've been able to portray that to the athletes. Yeah, it's definitely a piece of, of the puzzle that I try to tap into. But like Sam said, I really, as a person, um, use that holistic approach, you know, yeah. that uh, I learned myself, like I just mentioned from the story of 2000 Olympic trials, mm -hmm. you know, and it was a hard um, learning experience, but it, it made me who I am and made me the coach that I am today. Mm -hmm. Um, that I think has been effective and, uh, you know, the, just the focus the, you know, on the athletes themselves and, and trying to get them to figure out their own way um, has been uh, very, very enjoyable. And I was able to, to you know, have uh, um, some success at the NCAA level and, and, and have basically all facets of the sport covered from club, college, elite, uh, and my own personal experience, um, that culmination of, of everything together really spoke to me in this position as a high performance mm -hmm. director and being able to tap into every single one of those resources and, and give it to the next generation mm -hmm. um, has been extremely gratifying. I mean, it's, it's their team, you know, and, yeah. and I work for them and I try to just supply as many tools um, to them as possible and uh, they can take it or leave it uh, ultimately they're the ones out there raising their hand and right and they deserve all the credit um, for for all their success so it's uh it's been an exciting quad you know to, to see that transformation in the team culture and to be a part of it I'm, I'm extremely grateful and thankful for it and uh, uh, silver lining we get another 14 months of it right, right? Uh, getting prepped for for Tokyo once again I actually do want to pitch into the you know, having an Olympian be uh, an, or our high performance director, uh, something that happened at our world championships, you know, it was a very rough uh, world championships for our qualification day. And honestly, previous times, it would be a, a moment where all the athletes probably would have been screamed at or yelled at because of how poor of a performance day we had. And Brett came in, cool as ever just said, hey, guys, I know what you're capable of. We still made it to team finals. Go out and show out in that pro in that moment. And I think that's something that mm -hmm. I, you really wouldn't get unless you had been in an experience like that yourself. And so what that did is really just kept us calm. or It made us believe in ourselves a lot more. And I think that was, you know, a turning point of, you know, previous uh, directors that we might have had. And the fact that he knew that is stressful and to put on more stress on us in that moment when it wasn't a, as good of a day as we would have wanted was a really, you know, he understood what we needed. And that's something that you really can't get without having that experience. Right. I, I want to uh, jump topics a tiny bit and just go over the fact that you guys are all by yourselves right now, essentially, right? Like, Brett, you're at your house, Sam, you're at your house. We're all in a very unique and unfamiliar situation when it comes to training. Um, I'm curious, you know, living at the Olympic Training Center, Center the way that you do, Sam, and, and Brett, you being Colorado Springs as well, you have access to normally a lot of different um, ways to become a top athlete. You have your chef there, you have your sports science department, you have your recovery area, mental training. Are you trying to use any of these things um, virtually as much as you can? Are, are you, you know, giving the guys access to sports psychologists? Are you working with the nutritionists through Zoom uh, calls or uh, anything virtual? How are these guys outside of not being able to actually train? Are you guys using any of those other tools right now to be able to kind of stay on point uh, and connect together as a national team, even though you guys actually can't be in the gym together? Well, I can – start um the answer on this one we've we've done as much as we can you know trying to tap into as many resources as possible everybody has their own coping process and their own coping style and needs um so we've tried to just 
put it all out there, right? And here on this link to USA Gymnastics website is a list of all of these resources. If you personally want to go click and find um, a good plan for your nutrition to stay lean and mean, like Sam was saying earlier, on a budget, you got to go to the grocery store, pick up these essential items. Um, basically, you know, mental health is such a big deal. Um, being able to find the silver lining in a, in a tough situation and, and uh, trying to use it to your advantage instead of letting it inhibit what could be your performance. Um, we have these discussions uh, almost weekly. We try to put together national team Zoom meetings and uh, get a little workout going, led by uh, none the other than uh, Dave Durani, uh, Power <laughs> Monkey Fitness, um, which you know we had a blast doing. It was a 45-minute workout. My abs are still sore today, and uh, but it was it was good just to see everybody, and we try to stay in touch as much as possible. Um, and the Olympic Committee, uh, Olympic Parallel. Uh, Paralympic Committee has done a great job also providing some of these resources as well. Uh, Ron Brandt, who was uh, previous, my previous coach uh, here at the Olympic Training Center, is the High Performance Director for the U.S. Olympic Paralympic Committee currently. Uh, and he has a team, a team of five individuals that uh, all specialize in a certain area, whether it's sports psychology, uh, nutrition, strength and conditioning, have all been tasked to help all uh, prospective Olympians from all the sports. And they've done a phenomenal job just handing out resources to all the different national governing bodies. And uh, we're fortunate enough to have that personal relationship with those individuals here in Colorado Springs. So um, I know some of the resident athletes have been capable of, of just uh, picking up the phone and giving them a call. Um, Mason is our strength and conditioning coach has been phenomenal trying to, to get us prepared for the progression back into sports, right? So that plan hasn't been presented yet, but it's something that we are working on as well as all the NGBs um, to get everybody prepped uh, to get back into physical activity again. So um, we do what we can virtually. I know you all are doing the same thing, um, but always looking for more, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you guys have certain tools that have been sure. useful within your company, you know, we'd love to um, join in. Yeah, from the athlete standpoint, I, if anything, everyone's trying to provide so much that, you know, it, I really don't know what to do. <laughs> there's, I've never <laughs> had so many people trying to help, but then it's also like, there's only so much that we can do. And mm -hmm. by no means do I feel like they, there's, there's been so many resources given to us recently, especially with just being on lockdown. I think everyone's bored and just wants to, help in any way possible which is an awesome thing for everyone coming together like that but really what what they've done you know being at the training center for as long as i have is you know, they've taught me you know all the things that how to eat properly how to diet properly mm -hmm. how to rehab properly how to uh strength and condition and i've just you know i've learned over these years essentially what is going to be good for me and so you know, they, they do want to, you know, look over and say, hey, you're, this is this. But at a certain point, it was like, all right, guys, I'm just going to do everything that you guys have taught me at home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're obviously going to have our connections with the Zoom. But you guys have done a great job raising us, essentially. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the perspective that I've got with it. And, you know, I've been just maintaining diet and I've been gluten free, dairy free for this past year. And, you know, just being able to manage that as well. And, you know, just be as happy as I can because now I have so much more time to prepare my meals than I normally <laughs> do when I'm training so many hours a day. And it's, it's really just finding that mental happiness throughout this process. Are you training uh, uh, on a daily basis over there too? What kind of stuff are you normally doing with what you have access to? So I have a physio ball, parallettes, dumbbells. Uh, I've got two mushrooms, one with pommels, one without and uh, I've been running with my dogs a lot and yeah I just pretty much put together uh, I've got five sheets one for lower body one for core one for gymnastics one for oh gosh there's two more but I cannot say it right now. I can't remember what they are but essentially every day I'll break down and go through the, those lists and make sure I just hit all parts of my body and uh, if some part is more sore on another on one day I'll like you know back off on that one and make sure I'm not overdoing it because it's something that still can happen in this process sure yeah definitely easy easy for a lot of people to overdo especially in the in the CrossFit community 
the mindset of, of all people in CrossFit are to, to do too much anyway. So <laughs> I know I went through, um, probably 10 days or more straight where I did some sort of intense CrossFit workout. And I was like, wait a minute, uh, you might need to slow down a, a little bit, but, yeah. uh, Sam, I wanted to ask you and, and Brett as well, what during quarantine, since we all have so much more time on our hands, have you been doing more of outside of your training or gymnastics? I have been doing a lot more cooking, uh, a lot nice. more just, we've had really great weather uh, recently in Colorado, which has been nice. So just been sitting outside. Uh, a girlfriend and I have been playing a lot more board games. <laughs> yeah. And uh, just been playing more video games too. Um, yeah, just tending to the dogs. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> as you can hear. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've always enjoyed cooking, but uh, definitely taking it to a whole nother level. You know, making fresh pasta mm -hmm. from scratch probably wasn't <laughs> nice. wasn't in the plan. Uh, you know, even a few weeks ago. Um, but I have a a new baby girl who's just over four months old. So I've I've enjoyed um, spending much more time with her. Yeah um you know and my fiance so uh, she's also in the coaching world so she's you know, on as many zoom meetings as as i am so we're mm -hmm. we're playing a pass with a uh, little baby mm -hmm. mia between zoom meetings uh, which has been kind of fun yeah that's awesome what a blessing man that you get that little bit of extra time uh with a young one there i, I was always fortunate that i got to spend more time than most par parents do with my little one as well. But you can probably take some uh, cooking tips there from Dave. He's quite the chef himself. <laughs> he, always, he always likes to bring up that I wear an apron when I'm in the kitchen. I'm like, yeah, I like wearing an I apron. Can, I I'm just, yeah. every so time I think about Dave cooking, I envision him in the kitchen with an apron on by itself, nothing yeah, else. I don't wear anything else on there. It's no big deal. Yeah. No big deal. No big deal. Yeah, Brett, what you're saying about, have, you know, uh, my wife Sadie is due in two weeks now. And I was supposed to be on a cruise next week uh, doing a fitness cruise. Both Chad and I and a bunch of other coaches were supposed to be on a fitness cruise five days before the baby was born. Then I was supposed to be here for the birth. And then three days after the baby was scheduled to be born, we had our next power monkey camp. So there was like this window of like three days that I was going to be home where I was hoping the baby was going to be born. <laughs> and I, I swear every day leading up to this, Sadie was like, something please happen so that Dave has to stay home. Oh, no. And I was like, Sadie, Sadie, it's, you wish. So you're way blaming too hard. Sadie for this you, whole oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. epidemic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I blame it on her every morning. Yeah. Makes sense. But Makes sense. The, the, the blessing, the good thing that's come out of it is that I'm going to be here no matter what. And so I'll be here for the birth and for uh first little bit of the little nuggets life. So um, wishing being you here. well, Dave and yeah, Sadie. Thank you. Um, guys, we're coming up to, to the end here, but I did have uh, one thing here that I had written down that I, I want to just get your thoughts on. I don't even know if you guys know the answer, um, but we were talking a lot about um, like selection process and um, we brought this up. We had another Olympian on the other day and uh, we brought it up with Cheryl as well, but I had heard something and Brett, you might be able to, to allude to this too, but I had heard that the USOC was, uh, uh, the IOC had made a comment saying that uh, if selection processes had been completed at this point and an Olympic team had already been selected, that those spots would be guaranteed for next summer. Um, does that sound right? Had you heard anything like that? I had heard um, that individuals that had qualified to the Olympic Games retain their qualification status to the Olympic Games. Okay. I hadn't heard any specifics on team teams um like for example i think team usa men's gymnastics we qualified to the olympics in 2019 um i don't think it would be fair for us to have to go to another world championships and re-qualify yeah. um mm -hmm. into tokyo and there's not going to be another world championships between now and then anyway um, but that's just kind of in the gymnastic world um i could see that but as far as like team selection um you know, that I think is totally up in the air at this mm -hmm, time. Yeah. You know, you still have to make the team uh, 12 months from now because um, a lot can happen in, in this amount of time. Uh, some up and comers, you know, are, are definitely uh, in the hunt and probably more hungry than ever right now, considering the situation. Um, so I think it, it, to be fair, uh, to allow that opportunity to be selected to the team, I think 
is is a is a real thing. The other thing that I I, I had heard, and maybe Dave, you can confirm this, um, was the age restriction, uh, specifically on the women's side. Um, maybe prohibiting um, some of the girls who weren't age eligible for the Olympics in 2020 from actually qualifying to the 2021 mm-hmm. uh, Olympics. Do you know if that's I hadn't true? heard anything. I hadn't heard anything. But really my question, just re- with regards to whether or not those comments were true or not, was say you have a situation where uh, certain guys had qualified and they retained their spot. Now, some other guys in another country hadn't had their selection process done yet. And so that country could potentially, you know, there's pros and cons to both sides of it, but that country could potentially be in a better situation come later next year to be able to select the team that they want to put it out onto the floor. So that's why I was kind of curious if you're saying that, you know, if, if, if it was stated that the Olympic team spots that had already been selected are guaranteed for next summer, it kind of, create some more issues in terms of some some countries having selected and some countries not having selected in terms of what that does for for uh the structure of the team so i just didn't know whether or not that had been something that you guys had discussed or or looked at at all in terms of uh what the ic had put out it's yeah. a tough one yeah yeah i think it's just with all the sports it's probably still up in the air but i would hope my hope would be that if any teams have been named or any specific individuals had been named before all this that that they could retain their spot. I can just, we were talking about this on the last recording. I mean, it would be devastating. I can only imagine if I made the team, I put, you know, a lifetime work worth of work in um, and I made the team. And then a year later, I wasn't able to make it again. Um, you know, there's something to be said for putting out who is in the best shape, you know, at the time, but uh, man, this is just an unfortunate uh, circumstance, but that kind of aside, Brett, knowing that the Olympics are over a year away and being that it was coming up very shortly here in just a few months, it was supposed to be contested. Once everything is up and running again, how many times would you ideally like to see someone like Sam um, go out there and get on the big stage before uh, the Olympics in now 2021? Um, And is that any different from say someone that's uh, younger, doesn't have his experience? Well, You know, that's a discussion that Sam, myself, and his coach will have when the time comes. Um, There's a lot of variables playing into this um, situation. You know, how soon can we get back in the gym? How quickly can you get your skills back, routines, sequences, halves, things like that? Um, You know, and that's going to be the same, not just with Sam, but with with everybody. And uh, basically, I'm looking at, um, you know, our winter nationals is – hopefully the the time and place that everyone's back up to a hundred percent and maybe they've had some upgrades that they've been working on and, and can present them at that championships. Um, and then we can decide on who's going where, right. Based on, on that performance and who's feeling good, who's, who's coming up, who's retained their spot, uh, you know, and what's best for everyone's training plan. And uh, for Sam, it's, it's been very similar uh, the last few years. And so that's kind of what we've been sticking to, right. Is, is sticking to the plan, that preparation plan. We've had American cup and Tokyo cup. Uh, we've had national championships. We've had world team selection camp, and then we've had world championships, you know, typically Sam has about four or five major events. Um, maybe each one a little bit more intense than the other. And it's, and it's a curve, um, for, a, for an entire calendar year. And that's what's worked for him. Other guys like to compete, you know, some guys like to go every weekend. They're part of uh, NCAA program, and um, it's a really great environment for them to get that competition experience. Um, who hasn't been out on the international floor that might be in the hunt? You know, maybe that person uh, shows up at uh, at that winter winter championships and puts himself in a position to earn uh, a spot for experience leading up to you know USA's and Olympic trials in the Olympics. So. Um, there's just so much to, to, to plan for um, and to think about. Uh, and as we all know, this is such a fast paced, moving pandemic. Uh, things could change within a few hours mm-hmm. that it's been exhausting making plans and having to mm-hmm. cancel them. <laughs> yeah, so finally, after weeks of, of doing all of that, kind of calm down, take a step back and let's just wait um, a little mm-hmm. bit longer before we start making those steps. Right. 
right? Sam? Sam, not to put you on the spot, mm. what do you want to do next year? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I've really liked what we were, our plan was this year. And so if anything, just replicate what we were going to do this year for next year. And uh, what we've been doing a lot recently, uh, the past three years, I've been going to Tokyo Cup, uh, just try to get myself as acclimated and learn everything that I can about the travel to Japan, how mm -hmm. fast I can get prepared, and really just make that like my temporary home for a little bit so that when I do get out there uh, for the big competition, the Olympic Games, that it's a lot more comfortable. And I've gone through this a bunch of times. And so that, that's been the big competition every year that I think has been a progression going into uh, th for this whole quad going into 2020 slash 21 now. Yeah. Love yeah. It. We've been very fortunate um, to have so many experiences in Japan, not just Tokyo Cup, but we've got a great relationship with the city of Funabashi. Their high school boys program has probably the best um, men's gymnastics facility in the world. And they've welcomed us in as part of their family every year for the last couple years and uh, been able to really get in touch with, with their culture. And, and like Sam said, be familiar with it and be very comfortable um, in those surroundings and understand what it's going to be like um, when 2021 20, happens now. Uh, so I feel like uh, a lot of the guys on national team um, have had that opportunity. We've, we've, like I said, been so lucky to, to work with the city of Funabashi and their mayor um, to be able to get, if not all our national team guys out there um, and most of them. That's fantastic. That's, we've always seemed to have a really strong relationship with the Japanese program uh, and them being always one of the top teams in the world has been, I think, beneficial for, for the team USA guys as well. But uh, it's awesome to hear that you guys have had the opportunity to go and train out there that often. And Sam, especially you um, being able to get kind of the lay of the land prior to leading up to Tokyo. I think that's a great, a great kind of step forward getting ready for next summer now. Yeah, there's a lot to learn. I mean, it's a 15 hour time change. It's a 10 hour flight. Uh, what are you going to eat? What's the humidity like? How's the equipment feel? How's the chalk feel? These are all things that you need to really figure out before you can actually go and do what you feel comfortable with, you know, compete like how you train and being able to just figure all that out beforehand helps the entire team. And we've had a lot of guys make this trip. I think I've been to Japan close to five times in the past three years. And you know, I was going to get two more, hopefully, or I was hoping to get two more this year, but, you know, that's a lot of travel to Japan, and I've definitely mm -hmm. felt yeah. pretty pretty happy to have had those experiences. That's awesome. That, that's a testament to, you know, Brett and the program as well, to be able to set mm -hmm. those things up so you guys have the opportunities to accl acclimate and, and get used to all of those little things. I think most listeners that have no idea other than watching Olympics on TV, they have no idea that the humidity factors into how you hang mm -hmm. onto a bar or that a wood bar versus a fiberglass bar matters in terms of how you swing or, you know, that each country's manufacturer of equipment feels different in a different setting. So there's all these things that like you really need to get a feel for before you actually go out there. So, you know, the more, the more experience plays such a huge role in being able to feel comfortable. So that's huge. Yeah. All the little things add up and make the di biggest difference. That's for sure. Yeah. Hey, hey guys, I think we're going to be coming close to an end here. And um, we normally ask a couple of questions here. Chad, I'm actually going to, I'm going to save you from our question yeah, in this case. I think this shouldn't count. That's not fair. <laughs> we normally, we normally ask just to kind of get a running total on how bad I'm beating uh, Chad at this, but which sport mm. you prefer weightlifting or gymnastics. But I think we, we, uh, we, we know the answer to that one here. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're I, all I, biased. I'll, <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you guys, we've probably done maybe 20 recordings, and I think my tally is two. So, oh, wow. And one of them might have been me. So. Oh, jeez. Yeah. So we've got so, a lot yeah. of gymnastics friends out there. I just, I just you know, uh, urge everyone to, to select gymnastics whenever they're, uh, they're asked the question. But um, Well, I, I am a fan of being behind, Dave. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to make that comeback. I'm going to put my rally cap <laughs> Exactly, on. right, exactly. There you go. Uh, but thank you guys so much for the time. Uh, I appreciate it. I know um, you got a lot on your minds right now, Brett with the new baby and uh, Sam getting ready for now what is uh, 2021 but uh the time that you guys are able to to put out there for 
uh, our fans and our listeners is much appreciated. So uh, thank you very much for uh, sitting with us today. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having yeah, me. Did, did yeah, did either you. of you guys have uh, any last minute words you wanted to share with the listeners or um, uh, anything coming up? None of us have anything coming up right now, but anything you want to share and where can they keep up with you? Uh, they can keep up with us, or at least me, on social media. I don't post all too often, but I might be putting out a couple little workout things because it seems like everyone in the sport seems to be doing that. Yeah. What's uh, your account, but, Sam? Uh, it's at Samuel McCulloch. Um, it'll probably just be Instagram and Twitter and whatnot, Facebook. Um, but other than that, I think the biggest part is just staying happy, staying safe and staying in shape. Those are usually the three things I'm just trying to live by throughout these mm -hmm. quarantine days. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like Sam said, uh, safe, happy, healthy, stay at home. You know, I, <laughs> It's going to be still some time to come before we're able to get things back to what our new normal is going to be. Um, but, uh, you know, let's all do our part and, uh, you know, be smart and do the right things. And looking forward to, um, you know, everything coming up in the future when we get there. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, guys, it was, it was a pleasure meeting you both and, and chatting with you. And before we get off here, Dave, uh, did you have any updates from Power Monkey that you can share with the listeners? Anything coming up? Yeah, so we are continuing to do our uh, live sessions every morning at noon um, Eastern time. We'll have uh, Power Monkey Coach uh, from our stable of coaches doing a lecture, Q&A, or an actual workout. Um, I'm also, I also started a three day a week press the handstand seminar that we're doing live. That's sold out, but we'll do another one probably when the month is over. If you guys are interested, go to powermonkeyfitness.com or to powermonkeys.teachable.com. And we have a bunch of new programs and uh, ways to follow us through some of the live features on that website. So those are probably the best places to find us right now. Awesome. Yeah. And so in, in regards to services and, and upcoming events, that's basically it. That's it's all on zoom right now. So we're having a lot of, a lot of fun doing those type of things with you guys. And also check out our Instagram pages for regular teaching and technical content at Power Monkey Fitness, also at Dave Durante and at Ollie Chad. We'd uh, still love to hear from you guys uh, through email as well. Send us uh, a note at pod, or to podcast at powermonkeyfitness.com. You can shoot any questions that you might have for us that you want us to answer on the show here. Um, anyone that you want to hear from, uh, we can have them on as a guest or any topics you'd like us to cover. And on behalf of Power Monkey Fitness, we're your host. I'm Chad Vaughn with Dave Durante. And until next time, guys, thank you for listening.